Her name is Christy Argelon, and Christy is a very interesting character who is now on the client side after spending 20 years uh, in the industry as a, a media mover, shaker, and innovator. So we're, we're really interested to sit down and have a conversation. Okay, I'm gonna look at my notes to talk about the things that we thought would be interesting here, but the very first thing, of course, is 20 years in this industry, and now you're on the client side. Yeah. What's that like? What, what, why now, why Target? Yeah, um, really a couple of things. Uh, move like this, not only to go from agency side to client side, but also to go from lovely Northern California, Marin County, to uh, polar vortex of Minneapolis is, you know, it's a complicated decision. But I'll tell you what got me over those initial personal reactions was the fact that it's Target. And there is so much brand love for Target out in the world. Um, and also that it's one of those brands that has the brand at the core of the company, which for any of us right. who are in the business knows how, first off, unusual that is, but also how powerful it is. And so to be able to move from agency side, big complex problems, so that's okay. Sure, are we in the sure. shadows? Totally in the shadows. <laughs> it was nice there. <laughs> It was just me and Pete. Yeah. <laughs> we were really, oh, oh now, now totally I need my glasses. Yeah. <laughs> so to go from complexity of the agency side to complexity of a big retail company feels very familiar. Um, what is interesting, though, is that client side, you can make decisions a whole lot faster. So dealing with the exact same issues um, that I was at the media brands, uh, on the media brand side of things, but to be able to make decisions at lightning speed because it's me right to the CMO and control of the budget. I think that's because you actually are the decision maker. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's one of the things that those of us in the agency business and on the sales side have always sort of wanted to uh, have some experience with it. Being the decision maker is great. There's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. of being the one who actually decided where that money was going to go, but it's great. So I hear that you moved from Northern California, and I see that you're wearing orange and black today, so I have to ask if you're a giant fan, <laughs> or if that's just... I'm a Halloween fan, actually. All right. <laughs> I hope there are a lot of Giants fans out here. Just... Yeah, where, where's Dave? <laughs> Except for Mike Margolin, who is a Cards fan. I'm sure that there are a lot of Cards fans, too, so good for you. Um, it's interesting, in reading the, the press release when you came on board at Target in June, one of the things that it says, over and over again is this idea of integrating paid, earned, owned, and shared media initiatives. Obviously, it's a challenge, and in this multi-agency world with all the partners that we work with, how do you deal with that? You keep it simple. Stupid, right? K-I-S-S. -S. Yeah. Um, and this is the, um, the key piece for me. We as an industry tend to pick these devices that we use so that we can very consciously start to make different decisions as the uh, landscape changes. I actually think that paid, owned, earned, shared, and now what's the new one? Converged is the new term that's getting attached to that, so peso is turning to PESOC. Um, what's, what's interesting to me is that we use these devices so that we're more conscious of how we think about channel proliferation. And um, paid, earned, shared, owned, to me, is ready now to be simplified again to what does our guest, which is what we call our right. target audience, what does our guest want, what does our guest need to help her get through her customer journey and then to make the right decision to purchase. So the integration is coming at a really natural time for us. I love that you call them guests, and I, I think that everybody here who knows uh, the Target brand feels very strongly. It's, a, it's such a great brand. The idea of Target, I remember when I was very young and my first impressions of Target were people describing it saying, oh, it's like Kmart, it's like Walmart, it's like these other stores. And the reality is it's nothing like those. Mm -hmm. It's a company that competes with those, but it actually cares about the brand. There's a message there, there's a quality there, there's just a feeling there that you get from Target Mm -hmm. that, uh, that you don't get from those other brands. So it's something to be very proud of. I think one of the challenges that I always see from 
my side of the table, and I'm sure you saw when you were on one of those companies that was servicing clients, is there are so many people sitting around the table now. It's great that you get to make those decisions, but how do you get all those people to play nicely? I've found that um, where we are the full service agency and handling everything, even in that situation, there's still the challenges of everybody's idea needs to be vetted. Everybody thinks their idea is great. Everybody thinks they've got the best way to invest money. That's within one company where the decision making is still there. When you get lots of companies around the table, which we have with many of our clients, right. I've found that the best uh, operation or the best way for us to all get along is for the clients to decide early on exactly who's responsible for what and to keep from throwing scraps of meat on the center of the table and saying, everybody come up with an idea and we'll pick the one that's best. Right. Because then you turn collaborators into competitors pretty quickly and all of a sudden everybody starts playing things close to the vest. They do, and I, um, one of the things that I really appreciate about Target, and again, I've, I'm in my fourth month there, so I'm really starting to um, know the company better and better, but one of the things I appreciate is the responsibility that the marketing group feels for the relationships with the agencies, and that we don't, uh, we don't approach it like cats in a bag. Yeah. Um, we really do believe that we carry just as resp much responsibility for the health of the relationships as the agencies do in providing clear feedback back to us in terms of what's working and what isn't working. The other thing that works really well is that there is a five-person executive leadership group that I'm part of that runs the entire marketing organization, and we meet several times a week to talk about where we are on the work. We have um, campaign updates where different groups of people come in and share the work, they share the briefs, and we really have just a very open conversation about what's working and what isn't and what we like before it gets too far down the path. And that's the opportunity for us to really understand what's working from a human side and what's also working from a work side. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really able to troubleshoot in ways that, um, having worked with several clients, um, where it's not necessarily a natural way for a lot of organizations to work because we're all set up in silos. Right. Bridging those silos is incredibly difficult and you have to manage it pretty aggressively. Easier said than done. It, very much so. I mean, people have been talking about silos for years and the fact is it's, it's just hard. And it, yeah. I, I think one of the challenges is people need to understand the yardsticks that these other groups are measured on. Even right. within a full service agency, you've got creative ideas, you've got strategic ideas, you've got social, you've got all these things. And all of those people are being measured on something different. And I think one of those keys early on is getting everybody on the same yardstick. So everybody feels like success looks the same from my point of view and your point of view. Yeah, that's exactly right. And this is reasonably new for us too, to bring people together in this open environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, anyone who's got a lot of history with us would probably say, well, you know, there were a lot of times where we would get caught up in silos and who gets pulled in the room when and sometimes and still we bring some people into the room too late right um, but at least we're willing to take responsibility for that well i i did a presentation on collaboration at digiday last year and one of the things that when talking to people about putting this thing together everybody said the same thing share early and share often the earlier you share the easier it is for people to collaborate. The longer you develop an idea, the more wedded to it you get, the more tied you get to the way it's executed. <laughs> yeah. And if you share it early and somebody says, well, what about if you did it this way, you're still open. Mm -hmm. But it's like carrying that baby nine months down, you're, you, you're so tied to exactly the way you thought of it, it's really hard to yeah. kind of pull back from it. Yeah, that's very true. So changing gears just a little bit, the, uh, one of the things the Videonomics crew does that I think is really good and, and the reason why these rooms are, are interesting to the audience is they spend a ton of time going around and talking to the people in this room and the people in our industry talking about what's of interest to you, what are the things that are challenging you, what are the things that you want to learn more about. One of the things that came up in a lot of those interviews was the whole idea of automation. Uh -huh. And I know in your past life you did a ton with bringing automation to the agency world and the buying side. And I think there's a lot of questions about where does that belong? Outside companies, at the agency, inside the brands. What's your point of view on that or, or what's your different perspective from where you've been? Um, I, I would start by saying I think that there's plenty to do around automation that everybody can have a role in it. I think what we are tending to do is try to go all or nothing. You know, I'm going to control it all, and there isn't really anything to share. So I would su 
start by suggesting that we really look at what are all the roles and responsibilities that sit within automation and how do different people play in that sandbox. The, a couple of the things that are really important to us as a marketing organization is really going to center around the data. So who controls our data? Yep. And there are lots of conversations that kind of go like, as soon as your data is clean and ready, we will gladly take it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I don't think so. Right. right. Because it's our data. It's our customer. We have to protect it greatly, right? It's such an enormous responsibility. And so um, there, we will always run into problems if somebody feels like I'm going to grab it and it's going to be mine. Right. Um, so you really have to be clear on who should own what components of this, who should be making money off of those different components, and then really come together with the full ecosystem on that. So for, from our perspective, the two things that are most important for us is environment, so if there are second and third parties that are attached to any of our partners where suddenly we lose control over where our brand advertising is going to show up, that is a problem. Um, and the other piece is the data piece. So if we're sending our data to another company and they're either remarketing it, even if it's in a rolled up fashion, right. or if they're not sharing the information back, then that also is a big problem for us. Yeah, and I think marketers definitely have the fear of, well, if I give this to this agency or this buying partner or this other group, right now we're partners. What about two years from now when they're partners with somebody else? Are they going to use my data for that? Right. And luckily we haven't heard many stories about agencies reusing somebody else's data or selling partners using somebody else's data. But I know there's that fear. Everyone's but, concerned. But you could push on some of the ad tech companies who are then like the arm to the agencies and what are the practices there. Yep. So it's just really important that we're all crazy aware of the terms yeah. of how the relationships are working. They're all, it's all stuff you can work through, but you really have to be clear on what you, your expectations are for your agency relationship as well as any other partners that they pull into their ecosystem. Yeah, it's, all, it's also it's interesting to me. From the agency point of view, we're always concerned about conflicts. What's a conflict? Who's in this category? If we have Target, we can't have Walmart, all these different things. And from a technology point of view, it's amazing. The technology providers, no one ever seems to be concerned about conflict. It's like, oh, you've got category experience. You're a genius. I'm like, <laughs> well, we have category yeah. experience. Why can't we work on three of those brands? And, and uh, it's always fascinating to be with web development. No problem. We'll, we'll take the people who've done four different competitors. But on the agency side, I think there's just so much more about the brand. It's so much more of an emotional connection and that you're invested in that it's, um, it's really different. But, um, so one of the other things that we wanted to talk about was just this rush to social. With things moving to social, it changes so much. Where does the money go? Who controls those channels? How do you manage these things inside and outside? And when you're out there in social channels, who's got the voice of target? Is it people out there for you? Is it someone in your company? Is it a combination? One of the things that I I think clients fear in social is all of a sudden we've got this process that's 20 steps to get approval for anything we ever say anywhere. And then in social all of a sudden you've got some kid who can just get on there and say something and, and there's that real fear and obviously we've seen people make mistakes with those things but how, do, how does that work for, for yeah, you and your I, point of view? I actually, um, one of the things I greatly appreciate about the company is it fully embraces social. Um, because it's such a beloved brand, social has treated the company well as well. Um, but there absolutely are moments where, you know, things aren't always positive. And what the company does do is it engages in all of the dialogue. And so we do have a full team that is listening 24-7, or maybe 27. 26 <laughs> to everything that's going on and is very much there to respond in whatever way the team feels it's the right way to respond. So that piece is incredibly strong. We also though have a lot of content that we want to be pushing out and we run into a lot of problems in terms of being able to fulfill the content needs for that and having enough content where we can always have an A-B copy test going on. Uh, and enough people to watch how things are getting picked up and pushed around. So it's, you know, we're, we're letting go of the, rec the restrictions as quickly as we can mm -hmm. and continuing to expand our efforts around earned um, and around social in particular 
we are seeing that it is costing us more and more money to, to drive social. So, you know, right. it, it isn't free. Right. Uh, and, you know, you should never think of it as free. Free. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody started there. Well, it's, it's free. free. Just make it go viral when it's free. <laughs> exactly. You know? um, so, you know, we're, we're learning all of that and we just keep dialing up the volume on it as we get better and better at what we're currently doing. Well, I think the, the, the reason that free is funny is because free did work. Five years ago, you could put out a great video and it was free. We had a, a thing called a social experiment we did with Honda years ago and it spread to five million people on Facebook in no time. And those five million people, every time we put something out, it was on their wall, it was everywhere. Well, we all know at some point, Facebook's here. Mark Zuckerberg lost the battle to not make money at Facebook and, and there had to be a time when they were actually gonna start charging for the content, charging for the eyeballs and perfectly uh, acceptable practice. They started making it more difficult for you to just get that natural organic sharing and, and it started to require that you actually invested in, and spread. I think it's, uh, it's been interesting because it's required people to start being much more engaging in their content. It's required us to start thinking about, I can't just push this to people like I do on TV or like I used to do, but I actually have to create something that people want to see and want to share. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's been really interesting from that point of view. Um, one of the things I talked a little bit about in the opening, which I, I literally yesterday driving up here noticed the uh, story about the sustainable stam salmon, the video that Target did, and I thought this is exactly the kind of story that we're doing that I find to be so effective today. Doing a commercial about selling salmon at Target will get X amount of excitement and enthusiasm and attention, but telling a story about why you're doing it and how you're doing it from a real storytelling point of view with really good quality video is the kind of thing that people are interested in, that they want to share, that they also think, this might not make me go buy salmon today, but clearly it makes me feel good about Target. Right. Target's a company that's doing things the right way. So I, I was really appreciative of the way you did that. Is that cool, part of an overall and, and larger effort, or is this something specific to the salmon issue? <laughs> It's not specific to salmon, right. um, though we do love salmon. I, I, it is core to the values of the company, mm -hmm. which I think is a big part of why Target owns the space that it does, because it has a lot of heart. And I think that the guests completely get that. We know what our responsibility is, and we try to um, you know, be as responsible as we, as we can be. Uh, and that's just one of the storylines of the different ways that we choose to do business so that we're doing the right thing. Where do these kinds of stories come from? Who owns that kind of content? Does that come from your traditional agency, digital agency, social agencies? Uh, are they working together on that kind of thing? How, how do you get these people to all play in the same sandbox? Yeah, yeah. it comes from within the marketing group. Mm -hmm. And it is based on what we you know, believe are the right stories to share so that people can you know, embrace the story, but also so that they can understand the need to create their own stories that are like that as well. And uh, then we, what we do is we have multiple agencies on our roster, and depending on what the work is that we want done, we'll choose the agency to, to carry it. Great. Um, is there anything else that's specific or, or broadly that you'd like to talk about with this audience? It's a, it's a great group. It is. I think what probably one of the other things, and you had mentioned it in the beginning too, is just the need for content and how do we possibly fulfill all the content requirements yeah. that we have. So yes, a lot of what I'm focused on are automated marketplaces. I think that we will absolutely figure out the transactional part of our business. I, you know, we already know what the data is telling us that is different than what Nielsen broad demographics tell us. I, we already know that we'll be able to um, transact off of good platforms, right? Many of those platforms are represented here in the room. I think the biggest issue is once we do open up those pipes and we're transacting in an automated way and we want to start to change our media buys and our targeting in the moment, where's the content that's going to fulfill all of that? And as you rightly point out, there is a ton of content out there, but not necessarily the content that we need right. to be able to make those one-to-one -one connections that we're creating the pipes to be able to do. And you also mentioned that it's hard to do good video um, because, or it's hard to do a lot of good video because it's expensive. And I think what the challenge that I would toss out to this room to start to solve is how do you do good video and not have it be expensive? Yeah. 
right? Because there is going to be massive need for good video. Well, I think one of the good things about that, as I talked about a little bit, we're doing a lot of in-house production, and I think a lot of agencies are, and, and a lot of brands are. And I think one of the really good things about that is it's become a lot easier to be a quality content producer because the tools to make good quality, high def, broadcast quality video are available to every college kid. Right, it's a $2,000 um, studio purchase now. Right, instead it's a $2,000 yeah. studio we, We've got a great big green room and all these things, but the reality is you can do it with a, a $2,000 camera and a software package. Mm -hmm. And I think what it really comes down to, to me, is somebody who's got the eye to actually shoot, somebody who can really right. do, somebody who can really develop a story and find a way to make it interesting. And somebody, from a writing point of view, we really need to challenge ourselves to figure out how do we make content that people want to see? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we like to talk about the fact that we're not making digital marketing or marketing digitally, we are marketing in a digital world. And marketing in a digital world means our audience just lives in the space with all these screens and all these distractions. How do we get to them? And how do we get their attention? And more and more, I, I, when I got into this business in the early, or let's say late 80s, in, um, at Saatchi and Saatchi in, in LA, one of the things that I always remember as a creative director who was telling me that borrowed interest is just a weak crutch. You know, when you get a celebrity or you bring in somebody el uh, else or you try to play off something topical, that's just because you don't have a good enough idea. Mm -hmm. And I think that today, I would say borrowed interest is a staple. You know, you've got to find ways to tap into the things that people already care about. You've got to find ways to say, people care about you know, their local drive-in theaters, they care about their local communities, they care about the salmon fishermen, they care about the way that things are done. How do I make my brand fit in with that in an authentic way? And it, and it ha absolutely has to be authentic. It can't be kind of, it can't be forced in there. Yeah. That's very true. And what we find too with our guests is that they want to make the right decisions every single day. And if they feel like they can pick companies that make it easier for them to make the right decisions with how they spend their money, um, you know, where they shop, what businesses they support, that, you know, that's the kind of um, help that they're looking for. Yeah. And I know you're fairly new to Target, but I would assume that Target has much better brand loyalty than a lot of the retailers because of that brand and because of that thought process of this company's a little different. Uh, I think in most of the client categories that I've worked in over the years, we find brand loyalty is just becoming less and less important to people. Not that they don't appreciate the brands, but there's so much information and so much ability mm -hmm. to shop to find the absolute cheapest price today on this product that brands sort of become secondary until you become lazy like me and think, I'll just get it at Amazon or Target Online or whatever because I don't want to go to a store at all. Mm -hmm. But that value to the brand in, in a lot of categories has just sort of become less important. Right, especially when you consider millennials that are coming along, right? right? So they have a very different requirement from any person or company that they engage with. And uh, from our perspective, it's about behavior. What's a brand behavior that you know, shares the right values um, and, and acts with the right values. Hmm. I don't want you to give away any trade secrets or anything, but with millennials in particular, are there things that you're doing differently? I mean, I, we all talk about the fact that millennials aren't watching TV, they're cord cutters. I have a 23-year-old and a 21-year-old, and uh, they both watch much more video through Roku, Apple TV, the online browsers, whatever it is. They're still watching network programming, but sports is about the only thing that they're watching live. And I think, uh, we talk about young people do things differently. The reality is young people are going to be old people at some point. So mm -hmm. that's what drives the evolution of this market. But are there different things that you're doing to reach this audience? I mean, not, nothing that wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't already predict, right? Mm -hmm. We're developing far more apps. We have a lot of our spend going to digital. Uh, we consider mobile to be the entryway. So it's, you know, it, but everyone's doing that. Um, you know, I think that the company is just really good at understanding that they need to execute it and we're not messing around. So, you know, it's, uh, we are very much committed to that. It's funny you say um, mobile. One of the other things that I've been fascinated with lately is uh, the idea, how many times I've read the term mobile first. Mobile first, digital first, social first. I don't know why something has to be first. You know, one of the things that we always feel really strongly about is there is no perfect media mix that you can apply to every product. There is no perfect, uh, 
idea of how you do things. Everything should be about who are you trying to reach, what do you want them to do, what are your objectives. So I, it, I cringe a little bit when I hear mobile first or digital first or any of these kinds of things. And I know it's very common in the industry, but I think a little bit of it comes from the idea that there were so many companies and people who missed the internet wave the first time around and then they missed social and they missed this and then now it's like, oh, we're not gonna miss mobile, we're gonna put mobile first. And mobile's great. I'm not denigrating mobile and I know a lot of the people here are uh, mobile professionals. But it's just like when I used to go to search conferences with Mike Margolin over here, you'd see people stand up and it would be like, all money should go to search. Search is the most effective thing in the budget. Well, of course it is, because we did Super Bowl commercials to tell people they should care about that thing that they were searching. So I think this, one of the challenges t today, and one of the things I know you have a lot of experience is, is attribution of mm -hmm. where is that success coming from? We're looking at all these different mixes, and ROI is certainly something that people in this room care about. Uh, do you have any advice or any, any thoughts on that in particular, the, the idea of multi-channel attribution is something that we're, we're fascinated with, and it seems to get better and better every day with all the data that's now available to us. Yeah, so a couple of things in what you were just saying. So the first thing is, back to those devices that we use as an industry, we all say mobile first because actually we do TV first. So if I just keep saying it out loud, maybe I'll actually do it. You're right. Right? So that's the, we just keep smacking ourselves upside the head until, we, until it becomes natural. Um, the other thing is, um, what was the other part of the question you were asking? I don't know, probably. <laughs> oh, attribution, attribution, that little thing. Um, the other piece of attribution is in, you know, media brands, Target, no matter where we are having the conversation, what's incredibly important is we can do a lot of innovation around digital. We can do a lot in terms of attribution in digital. It doesn't really help me until it's channel neutral right. and that we've got offline media in there and especially television. Um, it will be a while before television is digital. Um, so there's a lot of effectiveness to get out of significant marketing spend that's happening across the industry. And so we have to take responsibility for understanding how to get television into this conversation as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because I think having worked in digital early on like you, I think one of the things that's really interesting is in the early days, everybody would scream at us digital people and say, well, you guys have got to show ROI. You've got to prove your worth. You've got to right. show us that this stuff is working. And I'd look at them and go, you've been buying TV for 100 years. You never cared about attribution. You never cared about ROI. Now all of a sudden, we're spending you know, $300,000 on search and you want me to prove it. I'm like, that's what these numbers prove, how many people have come here. But I think one of the things that digital has done is it's given people a taste for mm -hmm what you can do with proof, what you can do when you have not just, be, you know, not just uh, intentions, but actual behavior to measure and, and see where things are going. And I think part of it was that information just wasn't available, the data, right. the tools, all of that stuff. Now the data is available, it's a matter of getting people over the hump, and, and there's still a lot of ways to go when you, when you get to those disconnected things like TV and print. There um, are, and we're back to that, you know, 50% of my advertising works, and now I can say, and I know which 50%. Yeah. And so that, it, that, that day is here. A lot of it is still manual, right? Because we don't have our pipes completely opened up right. to be able to really apply it every day, all day long. But we can answer that question now. And I think that what is incredibly powerful is that we are seeing the TV networks responding to that as well. Yeah. And they're committed to changing the way that they do business. They also have a lot of complexity to work through because their system, you know, they're companies that have grown up by acquiring other companies, their systems don't talk to each other. How on earth do you automate a marketplace in a world where, you know, you can't even figure out how to get your commute computers to talk right. to each other. But they are so committed to it and I'm seeing an acceleration in changing the way that they approach a marketplace in ways that I've I've never seen. Yeah. Um, and it's in three month increments instead of three or five or 10 year increments. Yeah, uh, Josh and I were talking last night with Jeremy and a couple others. That it's, it's interesting, we're finally at that time where everybody seems to be embracing the change. Everybody seems to be open to what's changing in this marketplace? How do I need to do things differently? There's a lot more people trying to learn. I think for years, and I'm a traditional person first and then a digital person and really I like to think integrated and holistic, but I think 
we're finally at that point where even the people that sort of resisted digital and new, new terms mm -hmm. are starting to get much more interested and really pay attention. And I think part of it is because the digital sellers and the digital publishers are doing a much better job of starting to talk to people in terms that traditional marketers understand. Right. Um, one of the things that I know came out of the upfronts this year, there was a lot of discussion, I don't know if you were involved, but there was a lot of discussion about YouTube and other online video publishers were actually selling and packaging and talking like broadcasters. Mm -hmm. And it makes it much easier, and I know with Nielsen and other measurement tools, we're getting to that point where there's a lot more ability to just talk about who saw my stuff, right. how did that work, as opposed to using you know, one measurement here and another measurement here, mm -hmm. and then everybody in the room knowing they're not the same thing and right. they can't be collapsed. Because I think one of the challenges for digital video and television is if you're gonna really know the ROI, you gotta know how they're working and what, how they're working together and, and where those pieces fit together. Yeah, and what's really nice right now too is that we're seeing multiple companies come together with the ability at an Axiom or an Experian where you can actually match the data so that you really can get to full customer journey. And that's, mm -hmm. that's here now. Uh, and I think that that's incredibly compelling for all of us who are trying to understand what the, the journey is that large groups of our customers are yeah. on. It's funny, going back to what you said about saying mobile first, it's, it's true. I mean, you, you bring up a good point. I think internally, it's a really important thing to have that rallying cry and to change the lexicon. It's just the language that you use becomes really important. Um, one other follow-up on, I think, one of the things you said about getting people into meetings and, and getting people to share earlier. I think it's really funny in this industry, and I'm sure most people in this audience can identify with it. Everybody wants to be invited to the meeting and everybody wants a seat at the table. How many people in this room like going to meetings? <laughs> so it's this weird thing that being included in the meeting is a really, like it's some sign of respect or that you're being valued. You know what's being valued? Somebody coming from the meeting and telling you the important things that happened in the meeting. Uh, somebody <laughs> summarizing what happened in the meeting. Instead of all 20 going to the meeting? Yes, yeah, and I, I think hear, one yeah. of the challenges in this industry is literally trying to figure out how to make people feel that they have a seat at the table without actually putting everyone around the table. Right. And I think we're getting better with using social tools in the workplace. There's a lot more collaboration tools that we're using internally. There's a lot more video conference instead of running up and down the freeway or jumping onto planes and things like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Do you have any other comments? Cause it... yeah, I think um, probably the last thing, and uh, we were talking about this a little mm -hmm. bit when I was getting my mic put on, is this um, need for us to come together as an industry and really get clear on standardization. So if we're automating our marketplaces and we've got a lot of uh, digital companies that are doing that, that we've got a lot of, that all of the television networks and local MSOs, if everybody's out there figuring out their own way to automate a marketplace, we're gonna have a mess on the other side of all of this because the systems are all gonna be different. So there is either gonna be a huge opportunity in the middle to be the interface between crazy different systems um, or we should come together as an industry and really figure out what are the certain APIs that we have to have in order for all of this to work more fluidly right. across right. multiple channels and multiple companies. Right, I think one of the challenges that we face all the time is there's so much more data available, but it's not normalized in a way that you can just drop it in a spreadsheet and apply it across different channels and things. Uh, one of the other things that I always find fascinating about all the data that's available today is that we sometimes feel like the data is the answer. And I think that one of the things that we feel really strongly about is that Data is there to inform. Data is there to help you make better decisions. It's not there to make your decisions for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of those things that it, data helps bring, especially when you look at groups of people from different parts of the organization or different agencies, it's really good to use data to give you that sort of uh, third party standardization mm -hmm. of, your, uh, of your success metrics so that everybody can get on the same page. But Yeah, and then that starts to point to another issue that, we're, that we need to wrestle with, which is talent, right? So right. Where, are the where is the large group of data scientists sitting that are gonna come into agencies and really push that capability? Not only agencies, but client organizations and sales organizations so that we're able to really um, move on those transactions quickly. Yeah, well, 
I could go a whole hour on the talent issue alone in this industry. I think it's really fascinating right now. I, I, one of the things that we all face is that every time one of these new media channels has come on, the initial assumption is, oh, there'll be new budget for this because it's search. Well, you as a marketer have so much money to spend, and that amount of money isn't going to change because a new media channel comes for you to invest in. Right. So there's all these different places, and that's why these decisions that we're making on these channels are so difficult. I think uh, it, it really forces us to be smart about where we're putting that money and what we're getting out of it. So it's, it's very interesting. Um, we wanted to save just a little bit of time for questions from the audience. If there are anything in particular, it's hard to see out there. So um, I think Josh has got a microphone for you. Hi, how's it going? Uh, Dylan Conroy from Channel Factory. Uh, we were part of a integration this year with Target and Condé Nast publication Brides. And uh, basically what we did is we targeted the uh, bridal content that you guys were integrated into kind of a branded webisodic series against the most popular bridal channels inside of YouTube. Uh -huh. And we utilized the TrueView unit and um, because we targeted bridal channels, we saw a really, really high video completion rate even against like 10 and 13 minute content. So I'm just curious how you see contextual becoming more and more part of the video conversation. Yeah, I think that's kind of at the crux of it all, isn't it? And um, being able to set up processes and um, in organizational structure to be able to do that on a regular, consistent basis is really the big challenge that I think we're all facing. There's no doubt that we consistently see that, that if you've got the right environment set up, contextual is by far the most powerful, but how do you repeat it? And that's, that by, it's really such a big issue for, for everyone. Other questions? Let's yeah, hey Pete, over here. Way in the back. Ah. There we go. <laughs> Christy. <Hi. laughs> yeah, Scott McLernan uh, with Yumi. Uh, great discussion, by the way, great format. Um, so the, one of the questions or one of the topics that you brought up a couple minutes back was in regards to mobile first. And it led me to think about uh, that there's an awful, that people are looking for attribution of who's the first screen. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, if is the conversation are really around first screen, or is the conversation around what those what those screens do differently? And you know, so as you look at the campaign, are you building it around what screen first because what the, the KPI is of that particular campaign and objective? Yeah, I think part of the um, challenge is that whatever we think is the first screen for one group of our guests is not gonna be the first screen for the second group of our guests. So really understanding, and, and but we are gonna start with where do, we, where do we really want the customer journey to start and how do we see it unfolding based on the way that we're looking at the data. So there is, I don't think that we can answer that right now. I think that we, People, we do declare mobile first just because we, we know that there's a ton of viewership that goes on. When she's sitting and watching television, it's really the mobile device, whether it be her, her tablet or her smartphone, tends to be the dominant screen now. And we've seen that whether you know I'm working at Media Brands or at Target, that's a pretty consistent data point yeah. that we're seeing now. And so understanding how to build a full ecosystem of messaging so that we are embracing the full session that she has with the brand is the piece that we're really trying to figure out right now. I don't think that anyone really has the answer because you, it is so difficult to orchestrate going from one message to another when the purchase funnel is a swirl. It's not you know, a straight line that goes from start to finish anymore. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know. You know I guess it's, I don't have the answer to that yet. I think it's interesting too that we talk about first screen because one of the things that I find is my wife and I will be watching TV. She's got her laptop on her lap. I've got my iPad and my phone, sometimes my laptop too, but only during fantasy football. But the fact is it's really hard to tell which one is actually getting most of my attention. And sometimes it's this screen and this screen doing two separate things. And sometimes it's this screen, this screen, and this screen all doing the same thing. So I think it's, provides a lot of opportunities. And I said, as I said before, I think it's important to figure out, it depends on who we're talking to and what we want them to do. Who's your audience? And you know, when, when they're watching Homeland, do you really expect them to be going to their iPad and looking things up? 
Probably not. I hope if you're watching Homeland, you're paying attention. If not, you're probably going to miss the plot. But when you're watching football, there's like six minutes of action in a three-hour broadcast. So there's lots of opportunities. Uh, that's not a joke. There is actually like six minutes of action. And I think it is fascinating when you think about it how much free time that leaves you to look at stats, to look at other games, to check other content. Um, so those multi-screens work differently depending on what you're looking at, at least from, from my point of view. Chris, yeah. Hello. Oh, yep. <laughs> Christy, uh, uh, I was going to ask you a slightly different question to take your, or your, uh, your customer's journey further down the road because with mobile, of course, it's not, it's not really just about the marketing campaign because once, once you're in store looking at your <laughs> device, you're doing a whole set of different things. So how, does, how do retailers like yourself, um, how do you switch gears when, when they when the, when they use when it's not really about marketing now, it's about how I find what I'm looking for in the store or the best price point. How do you integrate that internally? Yeah, we um, currently have a couple of apps that we use um, to help facilitate the shopping experience that actually are um, becoming quite successful and that there is a pretty loyal user group within our, our guest segments. And we're really excited about that, but we need to keep going in that regard in terms of development of more, um, especially uh, the app capability sitting within the mobile phone. I think probably the greater opportunity is the, the notion of beacons throughout the store and how do you use those to really drive the story, right? What's the store story? What's the merchandise story? And um, while we have apps that are driving more from a promotional perspective, how can you use beacons to help actually create a story as someone's kind of, as they're strolling through the store? Uh, and that's the piece that, from, from my perspective, is wide open and will be one of the areas that, that we'll push for going forward. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, so I want to touch on something I think both Pete said and, and that you said as well, which is um, just this notion that there's, there's all this data that comes out of digital and you're, as a brand marketer, you're kind of waiting for that information to come to you with respect to your TV spend because it still represents, I imagine, still the largest portion of your spend as it does for, for most brands. So my question to you is really, how important is it to you that TV becomes digital in the sense of being able to get the same analytics that you get for your TV buy as you do for your digital? Are you seeing that happen yet? And if not, what do you feel as a brand marketer you need from the industry in order to help accelerate that transition? Yeah, we actually are working with a couple of different data companies that do give us the level of data that we want. Uh, in terms of how television is performing. I will also say, though, that while we have a lot of digital data, we don't always look at the right digital data. So we're also pushing to back off of some of the metrics that are very specific to digital that we can't necessarily prove that they drive to a sale. So we're, we're trying to normalize the way we look across all media in that regard. I, I feel like we are on the verge of really having uh, target audience based information for television that will allow us to go from watched this show, went to this website, took this action on their mobile device, and then bought. And you know, that, that's not just sitting within the walls of Target, that's sitting in a lot of different organizations. And it's because we're all getting creative with what the data architecture needs to be in order for us to be able to answer these questions across all channels. And so that's different than where we've been as, a, as an industry. We've accepted you know, Nielsen demographics as the currency. You've read the press over the last couple of weeks where Zenith and now WPP are really pushing uh, the use of rent track in more of the transactional discussions. So it's, it's pushing the conversation to a much healthier, much more business outcome based uh, perspective than we've ever had before. Uh, our spend tends to be, we're obviously a very aggressive digital uh, spender, so our ability to get television and digital on the same plane is a big priority for us. Well, Christy's answer was a lot better than mine was going to be, so I think we'll leave it at that. And uh, <laughs> I would like to thank Christy very much for participating. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you.